my computer. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I'm going to come from a slightly different position and I'm going to talk about mobile phone activism in Africa, specifically um, SMS and how this is being used. But what I want to do is give a more critical reading um, on how um, mobile phones are being used. I'm not going to talk about Twitter and the uprisings in Egypt, Tunisia and other parts of Africa but I just want to focus on how they've been used at grassroots level, um, for ad mostly for advocacy, but also for activism. Um, in t oh, the thing has disappeared. Oh, okay. um, in 2010, I edited the book, SMS Uprising, and I'm going to base my talk on that. Um, there's no doubt that mobile phones, particularly SMS, have brought about pervasive changes in communication in Africa, providing new opportunities for networking, mobilizing, information and service provision. But the fact remains that social transformation requires more than simply a set of technological tools. Technology has never been socially and economically neutral, and there's an increasingly deterministic narrative surrounding the usage of new media. If we are to work towards progressive social change, which is what I'm talking about, then we need to reflect on this and move towards, move away from technology hype and place people, not technology, at the center of change. The present figures estimate there are about 500 million subscribers in, across the continent of Africa. And that is not people, but subscriber, because a lot of people have more than one phone and a lot of people share one phone or one um, service. Um, the subscriber rate is unevenly distributed. For example, in countries like Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa, there's a very high subscriber rate. In other countries like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Gabon, the subscriber rate, uh, rate is much lower, partly because of due to cost and partly to do with regula regulation. For example, the, um, there's very little competition in Ethiopia and Eritrea whereas there's more competition in countries like Nigeria and Uganda. Other influences are the influence subscribers are connectivity, power supply. In countries like Nigeria and Kenya, power supply is a big issue. The cost of handsets, and more importantly, the cost of airtime, and of course, literacy and language are also um, problematic, especially in countries, again, I refer to Nigeria because that's where I'm from, but also it's one of the countries with the highest number of languages, somewhere above 300. Even though there may be five or six main languages, there's still languages a big um, issue. Um, whilst there's a huge number of services and applications around SMS, I'm concerned about the lack of critical evaluation from the development sector and the news media on the real effectiveness, reach, and sustainability of a lot of the projects that are taking place. There's very little discussion, for example, around technology diffusion, which is very uneven. It's the economically and socially marginalized, like women, the elderly, and the poor in general, who benefit the least from technologies. And my question is, is there any evidence that mobile phone usage for activism and advocacy is any different than any other technologies? My own research in compiling SMS uprising led me to consider a number of interrelated questions around the above, which I'll broadly address. The first one is, is social change more than just a drop in the ocean? And I'm talking specifically about SMS here. I'm not talking about Facebook or other YouTube or other kinds of social media. And I think it's also important to say that the majority of people on the continent of Africa are not using, don't have access to the internet. I think the diffusion rate is possibly about 5%, but again, that's very uneven. So I'm just talking simply about voice and SMS. In terms of providing communication, information, and services to those previously denied, there has been some progress. Services like M-Pesa, Medic Mobile, which are based in East Africa, have given people access to banking and medical information, which they didn't have before. But also, we have to think about the corporate interests that drive these products, like M-Pesa and um, Mobile Medic. 
which is not a bad thing in itself, but we need to be just aware and also look at the additional costs to people, such as being locked into contracts, advertising, and creating debt. One area where SMS has been impressive is in election monitoring and voter education and participation. The first country to use SMS to monitor was actually Nigeria during the 2007 elections. And again, it's been, the SMS is being used to monitor the elections that never happened last week, but will happen next week. Um, the interesting thing about that is already on the map where the um, voting is located, the, the, there's already numbers of voters, so I don't know how they're going to remove that data and put the new data on, which I could explain. Um, I'll explain that later. Um, SMS has also been used in Kenya to monitor um, post-election violence, to report and monitor post-election violence, in Zimbabwe to monitor um, the elections and the violence around the election, in Gabon, Rwanda, to name just a few. Um, two programs that were particularly useful in, in, in monitoring are Yush Yushahidi, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is a crowdsourcing platform, and Frontline SMS, which is a bulk messaging service. SMS has also been extremely useful in managing and monitoring emergency and disaster relief, relief as was shown in um, Haiti in January 2010. The second question is, to what extent are SMS innovations breaking down traditional gender, gender hierarchies, or are they creating new hierarchies, and are they always appropriate? I give an example, Wognet, which has been at the forefront of ICT training for, in Uganda for 10 years, and I'm sure many people here have heard of Wognet. They provide rural farmers with e-agricultural information via SMS. Each year, they've also participated in the 16 days of activism against violence against women by sending out SMS messages to their subscribers. They've also used SMS to mobilize women to gather for protests. However, the question is, it's very difficult to obtain accurate information. And the question is, how many farmers have actually benefited from the e-agricultural um, programs, not just in, in, in Uganda, but there's also in Cameroons and other parts of West Africa and in Kenya, and I think in, um, in um, possibly in Zimbabwe, but I'm not sure. So how many women are actually benefiting and in what way? Who is evaluating these projects? In terms of the campaign against violence against women, again, do we look at the number, the quantity, or do we look at the quality? How do we measure change? How do we measure how these are successful? How do we know what happens to those messages when they reach the women on their mobile phones? How has this in any way impacted on changing their status or violence, um, or, or the, or violence against women? Does it reach men as well, um, being that they're the ones that are committing the violence? Another project, um, which is an example of inappropriate use and also speaks to breaking down hierarchies, is a project called the Unyango project, which was a pilot project in KwaZulu-Natal. The idea of the project was to encourage women to report domestic violence, issues around land rights and inheritance, and political tensions in their area. It also had an information um, segment which was providing information on their rights. But they, what they found out is that women did not want to report any of this, the, either the political tensions or the violence um, via SMS voice or even by phone. They only wanted to do it in face-to-face -face situations. So the question is, again, is who designs these projects? How, to what extent are the communities um, to what, to what degree is, does collaboration take place in those communities? Asking rural women to secretly report violence may well reinforce gender hierarchies and is surely going to make them even more vulnerable. A much better way would have been, and a more inclusive way would have been to have a project based on dialogue and this would have been more appropriate and also more, more sustainable. 
The third question is, are people being turned from citizens into consumers? Mobile SMS for service provision, advocacy, activism is really good business for mobile service providers. The fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. A recent headline, why the world's poor are its strongest market, provides an ideal example of why support for mobile phone based projects benefits corporate interests. The lack of critical analysis means we're not looking at the implications for locking poor people into consumption patterns through advertising and so on. Furthermore, none of these programs really address the root causes of poverty, but are based on the same capitalist logic of a few at the bottom getting rich, but for the majority remaining poor. Focusing on programs used for collating and providing medical information are extremely beneficial, but they also ignore the cutting and funding of HIV, for example, HIV funding um, to AIDS programs. Again, how beneficial is a literacy program which is, which is mobile phone based for women in Senegal when traditional methods could work just as well? What consultations took place? How beneficial is it to the mobile service providers whose profits increase through the purchase of handsets, airtime, response to advertising? Who is pushing these projects? Another project is the MMAGI mobile application, which was developed for use in Kibera in Nairobi. The, 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 the application, which is like an a, um, iPhone app, enables people with that application to access prices and availability of clean water. But what happens if you don't have a mobile phone or you don't have one that can take the application? How does this address the issue of clean water and sanitation as a right? Instead, hierarchies may well be gendered and be created and gendered between the, those that have the applications and the mobile phones. So there needs to be a much more critical way of, of, of addressing these issues. Is, are these technologies sustainable? Freedom Phone is one of the most exciting developments in, in, in Africa. It was developed in Zimbabwe by Kubatana Trust. And what Freedom Phone does is really amazing. It merges mobile phone technology with broadcast technology and allows anyone with a phone and a laptop to become a, broadcast, to, uh, become a broadcaster. However, there are questions again about sustainability. If the idea is to reach those people who don't have access to the internet or to television, then how do we fund their SMS messages? How do we fund the phone calls? Another problem which is happening a lot is, and I'm sure many people here will be aware of these, um, this problem, is the plethora of pilot projects. People come up with new ideas, funding is obtained because it sounds very kind of new and sexy to use a, a, the, the, a, a media expression, which is offensive, but that's the word that they use. Funding is obtained, the project is set up, it fails for one reason or the other, the communities are left with nothing, designers and funders move on to the next magic moment. Fifthly, how, how much have mobile phones really facilitated or led to transformational um, change? People bring about social transformation, so surely the focus should be on the substance, not the tools. Otherwise, why aren't revolutions taking place in the West where we have 100% penetration? <laughs> Activists in Tunisia and Egypt... <laughs> Activists in Tunisia and Egypt had been working for years before the mass uprisings. They didn't just happen because Facebook was there or Twitter was there. In fact, Mubarak tried closing down the internet and the mobile phone um, network but the revolution continued and people returned to using faxes, leaflets, and the, 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 the original communication device speaking. Um, so what I'm saying is basically that hype is good for business. The more we hype Twitter, the more we hype Facebook, the more we say these things cause revolutions and these things have magical um, um, tendencies the more it's good for, for, for the designers, the service providers, the donors, the NGOs, the corporations, and the governments, all pushing projects and usage, often without consultation with people. The downside is that all this, for every positive thing that you can do with Facebook, SMS, and Twitter, they are also excellent tools for surveillance, 
for, dis for, for disrupting. In Nigeria, for example, in 2009, 2010, SMS messages were used to mobilize to kill people. This was in the middle belt in Jos. They were also used um, in, in the post-election violence in Kenya to spread hate messages. So they can be used, they're not, they, they have other uses besides what we all might use them for. And on the digital divide, is there a digital divide between, uh, divide being created in Africa between those that have SMS or are SMS rich and those who, who don't? And from my reading, I would say yes, there are those who are funded and those who, 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 who are not. Some countries are SMS rich, some countries are not. For example, my country, Nigeria, is very SMS poor, whereas countries like um, Kenya and Uganda are SMS rich. To conclude, technologies are not universally appropriate and a default solution to economic and social problems. Diffusion of innovations and technologies is highly uneven and reflects the economic and social power relations in, of the society which creates them. Gender, race, ethnicity, age, ability, and class differences are often magnified by technologies and commercial and market forces further amplify these differences and can end up impoverishing people even more. So what we need to do is really to put people first, their needs, their capacities, their environment, including the infrastructure. But more than anything, and speaking to you all as, as people that work um, in the funding, um, I don't know if they call it a business, um, is that to be a lot more critical in evaluating the projects that are using these technologies. Are they really reaching the people that you, they're intended for? Are they really making a difference? Because I have my doubts that a lot of pro, uh, projects that are out there that actually are reaching people and actually are making differences. And also, there is this, I want to emphasize this, there are certain pockets on the continent that have a lot of projects, technology-based projects, and there are other parts of the continent that have nothing at all. And I, I would like to investigate that a little more. Thank you very much. So, Kari, thanks for bringing all those points into the dialogue here. Uh, Amanda.